Welcome everybody. Um, it is with great pleasure that I'm here to speak speaker to you, Professor Arthur uh, Rayanti from Imperial College. Arthur did uh, his PhD in Helsinki, my, my home city, uh, with Professor uh, Theo Rayanti, who is still active. And then um, he did a couple of postdocs in uh, Sussex and uh, in uh, Cambridge. And since 2005, he's been a professor in Imperial College. And today's presentation is by Tom. Thank you very much. Thanks, Hildes. It's really great to be here. I think it's my uh, second visit to, to Dublin, but the first one was probably 20 years ago. So really, really now that I had an opportunity to come here in person, I thought I should take it rather than just give a, give a Zoom talk. I've given far too many of them in, during COVID, and it's always nice to, nice to visit places in person. Um, so, so yes, I will be talking about um, work that I've done over the last five or six years um, with uh, mostly with my my PhD students or former PhD students Oliver Gould, uh, David Ho, and uh, current PhD student Kinga Coverage. And this is um, so monopoles and baryons from sphalerons and instantons. And what this is really about is um, is these two two things that we all learn in school that these are facts uh, of of the universe um, very basic things um, magnetic fields have the, have no sources field lines no, don't end and so there's no magnetic charges um, which uh, means that there are no magnetic monopole particles there's no particle that carries a magnetic charge and the other is that matter is conserved now obviously matter can uh, during this year, during centuries, what, what people mean by that statement has changed because of chemical reactions, nuclear reactions, and so on. But even currently, um, what, be, what people would uh, interpret with that statement that matter is conserved is that baryon number is conserved, that, um, uh, that uh, any process, uh, in any, any process, the total baryon number, net baryon number, um, is not changing, and um, these both both of these statements are empirically true. They is, we have never seen a process where baryon number is violated, and we have never seen a particle that carries a magnetic charge. However, both of them also theoretically are believed to not be true. Uh, it's believed that. Um, uh, so certainly the standard model, even the standard model predicts that baryon number is actually not conserved. There are non-perturbative sphaleron and instanton processes which violate baryon number conservation. And also there are lots of um, reasons to believe that magnetic monopoles actually do exist um, and that we just haven't found them yet. And so therefore we are in a situation where we've got two statements which most of uh, most of the population think are, are solid facts. We theorists believe that they're not true, but we have actually no empirical evidence for our belief. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about, is how we could find that evidence, how we could convince others that actually we are right and they are wrong, and uh, these two statements are not true. And the, what, what I'm going to be doing for that is, is asking what happens in very strong magnetic fields. So I'm going to be um, arguing that with strong magnetic fields we can we can violate both of these uh, statements and therefore prove that they are not true. So could strong magnetic fields allow us to confirm this empirically? And we are talking about very strong magnetic fields, so not today but possibly in some distant future. Okay, let me start with monopoles, because that is, in some sense, um, easier. The, uh, the, the processes I'm talking about are easier to describe. Um, so, I will, I will give you uh, Teslas. Um, so, so, yes, I will come to that. Um, yes, so, with magnetic monopoles, obviously, you know the history, so, um, 
initially when uh, Maxwell first uh, wrote down the subset of, of his equations, he actually included a term for magnetic charge. Um, and, but then in the complete set of equations that had dropped out, or he did not include it, and he actually explains why he, um, why he didn't include that, and that was based on Faraday's experiment, which were by today's standards very, very basic. But that, that's, that was the empirical reason why Maxwell's equations don't have um, a magnetic charge. Uh, in them. And, but that actually now seems to be um, a very much an uh, empirical fact that it was the right thing to drop it uh, from the equations. Um, it was taught at the uh, turn of uh, the 20th century that, um, that actually uh, there's a, when, of the start of the 20th century with quantum mechanics that that explained why, um, why, why the um, magnetic monopoles don't exist because obviously in quantum mechanics uh, you need to formulate your electromagnetic field using the vector potential and when you write magnetic field in terms of the vector potential then it follows uh, from simple uh, vector um, calculus that, um, that um, uh, it can't have sources. However Dirac showed in 1931 that that's actually not true because you can set up a configuration where it is, a, it is singular, but the singularities are not observable. So you have a, a point-like monopole connected to a, to a singular string, Dirac string, and which, which is which, where the vector potential is singular, but unobservable. And uh, that's possible if the magnetic uh, charge, the strength of this magnetic monopole, uh, satisfies the Dirac quantization condition, which is a statement that um, either you can say that all electric charges are integer multiples of 2 pi over g, where g is the um, uh, magnetic charge, or conversely, that the magnetic charge is an integer multiple of the Dirac charge, which is 2 pi over uh, the fundamental uh, elementary electric charge. And so Dirac showed that uh, magnetic monopoles are compatible with quantum mechanics, but only if the charge is quantized. And this charge is actually um, a strong charge compared to the, uh, to the charge of the electric charge of the electron in the sense that the dimensionless um, charge in natural units has a numerical value um, of 20.7 if you just calculate what 2 pi over the electric charge of the electron is. And what that means is that, um, for example, perturbation theory doesn't work for magnetic monopoles because this charge, uh, it, would be a per it would be a power series in this charge and its value is um, uh, large, much greater than 1. But this is very interesting and very useful for, for us that you actually know something about magnetic monopoles. You know, if they exist, we know what their charge must be must be an integer times 20.7 in natural units. So, uh, and that's a large number, and that means that they are actually uh, easy. We, we know that they interact strongly with the electromagnetic field. Um, on the other hand, and, and that uh, is also, one could even take that as a, as a hint that monopoles could exist. Here is a, a quote from uh, Dirac. Does this work? Yeah, from um, Dirac. Uh, himself pointing out that um, the existence of magnetic monopoles would explain why the electric charge actually in the real universe seems to be quantized because it requires uh, that. So um, there's no other um, explanation even today for the quantization of, of electric charge. And so therefore you could take the, that as a hint that maybe monopoles do exist and um, because the electric charges do seem to satisfy this pattern. However, so the charge is determined, but what is important is that if um, monopoles, like Dirac was implicitly assuming here, if they are really just point-like particles, then uh, their mass is a free parameter. It, uh, the theory doesn't predict it. it and um, it, just like 
the mass of any electrically charged particle, it, if you can't compute it, um, it's something that you have to go and measure. And so therefore, uh, for Dirac monopoles, for this kind of elementary monopoles, um, it is something, uh, the mass is something that you have to determine um, empirically. And we don't therefore know what the mass would be if monopoles exist, but we do know what the charge is. Okay. Um, the, I'm, I'm talking about Dirac monopoles because um, uh, to some extent I will be, I will be um, using them as the model for monopoles, but it's, um, and they could exist, it's perfectly possible that this kind of elementary uh, magnetic monopoles exist. However, um, there are also theories where magnetic monopoles uh, arise as uh, nonlinear solutions of the equations of motion, and that would be uh, the tuft polyakov monopole or some variants of that. And so Tuft and Polyakov found uh, that if you take SU2 gauge field theory with the scalar field in the adjoint representation, then there are solutions, the hedgehog kind of solutions, which carry a magnetic charge, um, which is 4 pi over the electric charge. And um, one point here to note is that this is twice uh, the minimum allowed by the Dirac quantization uh, condition. And these are very different objects uh, microscopically from a Dirac monopole. So the Dirac monopole is a point-like elementary particle uh, which you just have to add to your theory as a new type of degree of freedom. tuft polyakov monopole is just, uh, it's not a new particle, it's, a, it's not a new field, it's uh, the same quanta but they are arranged in a certain very specific way which gives rise to a new excitation. And what that means is that the mass, for example, is calculable as the energy of that state. And it is um, number times uh, 4 pi v, the wave of the scalar field over E, or perhaps more usefully for our purposes, if there are, uh, the same theory has electrically charged particles with mass little m, then typically uh, the, the mass of the magnetic monopole is some number times m over e squared, where e is the electric charge and therefore um, roughly 0.1. And uh, so therefore um, this would, sorry, 0.3. So e squared is 0.1. And uh, so therefore the mass of, uh, what this is saying is that the mass of two Spolokov monopoles is typically uh, 10 times higher than the mass of the electrically charged particles predicted by the same theory. And so um, that allows us to then, so this of course, this theory here, SU2 and adjoint uh, scalar, it was originally proposed as the George I. Glashow theory for electroweak uh, interactions, but you know that it's not the correct theory, correct electroweak theory, but um, uh, the same solutions can be embedded in other theories which are which can be realistic, so especially grand unified theories. And one can show that any grand unified theory has this kind of tuft polyakov monopole solutions. And from that we can therefore see that because the energy scale of grand unification is typically uh, 10 to the power 16 GeV, then the mass of uh, gut grand unified theory monopoles will be 10 to the power 17 at GeV which is a very, very high mass. And that would then explain why we haven't seen this uh, in experiments. Um, uh, uh, magnetic monopoles, very much of the tuft polyakov type, also arise in other theories. Um, kind of in, typically, all string theories have some kind of uh, monopole uh, excitations, monopole particles, but then they can be heavier than this. They can, uh, uh, it can be as, as heavy as 10 to the power 20 at GeV. But also there are unified theories, so sort of grand unified theories, um, typically of the, of the Patisala uh, type, where the mass of the monopoles uh, is significantly lower than 10 to the power 17 GeV. And I'm just quoting one example from 2022, where um, the mass is 160 TeV. And so this is just to show that they're not necessarily 
ridiculously heavy. Uh, 10 to the power 17, have no way of really uh, building a particle accelerator that can reach that kind of energies. But 160 TeV um, is not at least completely out of the question. And so therefore, um, also these uh, tuft polakov kind of monopoles could potentially be within uh, the range of our uh, experiments at uh, some point in the future. But there is a problem with, uh, especially with the, with the tuft polakov monopoles. Um, if you want to produce them in, in particle collisions, which we would obviously try to do with uh, most particle experiments. And that um, uh, was first pointed out by Witten and then uh, made more precise by Drukhier and Nussin of, I think, 1980s. And um, it's basically that the production uh, amplitude, the production cross-section for producing a monopole antimonopole pairs in any collision of two particles, no matter how, no matter how, how, how energetic the collision is, is always going to be exponentially suppressed by uh, exponential of minus four over the fine structure constant, which means at 238 orders of magnitude. And if that suppression is there, then it doesn't really matter what is in front of it because the cross section is going, going to be so incredibly small that you'll never be able to, um, never be able to see any of, any of those processes. And uh, this argument is basically uh, based on, you can, can understand it as, uh, as a consequence of entropy. And um, it's basically uh, because solitonic monopoles, like tuft polakov monopoles, are collections of quanta, a very particular arrangement of quanta. And um, uh, basically, uh, one over alpha is the number of, of quanta that need to be arranged in a very particular way in order to, uh, to produce a magnetic monopole. And when you have a collision of two particles, you're going to produce lots and lots of other particles, but they are generally can be in any kind of a, a microstate, any kind of a configuration. So the probability that those hundreds of particles that you produce in the collision happen to combine themselves in just the right way to produce a magnetic monopole is very small, even if you have enough energy available. And an analogy for this argument is, um, is shown here is that you could, if you have enough energy available, the, two, the product, uh, collision of two particles, um, you would have a non-zero probability of producing <coughs> an elephant and the elephant pair. The laws of quantum mechanics say that that is a possible process and there is a certain amplitude for that. But we know intuitively that it's extremely unlikely that out of all of the possible uh, ways in which the particles, the quanta that are produced in that collision that they arrange themselves in, that they will produce elephants, is going to be absolutely minuscule. And it's exactly the same reason um, why um, the monopoles are unlikely uh, to, to arise. It's just because there are so many other states available. Um, so the entropy of a monopole, entropy of an elephant is too low. Uh, this argument only applies to solitonic monopoles, so to Spolakov monopoles, um, not elementary monopoles. Um, it ha has, it's based on certain arguments. It has not been confirmed by a precise calculation. It, uh, there has been a calculation for King uh, production in one plus one dimensions by Demidov and Levkov, but not monopoles in three plus one dimensions. However, uh, it is believed to be um, a valid statement. And if this is true, then it does mean that um, production of uh, monopoles in two particle collisions is just practically impossible. And if it's impossible, then even if light monopoles exist, we would not have produced them just because of this entropic uh, uh, suppression. And therefore, even light monopoles could exist because the, our only knowledge of the mass of the monopoles comes from experiments empirically. And if you can't 
use particle collisions as an argument that they don't exist, then we don't know that they don't exist. And so what this means, and as I said, this applies, the argument applies to only solitonic monopoles. We don't know if the same argument applies to point-like elementary Dirac monopoles. But in that case, we don't know how to do that calculation because perturbation theory does not work. So we don't know. It could even be the case that there is a similar suppression in that case. We just don't have the tools available to do that calculation. And so, yeah. <laughs> that is because of CT violation, absolutely. But yeah, no, I won't be talking anymore about ele elephants in this talk. Um, but yes, so what, uh, what this is basically just saying is that um, uh, collisions of two particles, protons or electrons or whatever, is not a useful way of uh, looking for monopoles. We've been doing those experiments, but they actually, we can't conclude based on those that even light monopoles don't exist because it's perfectly possible that those uh, processes are incapable of producing light monopoles. So therefore, if you want to really look for monopoles or if you want to be able to make the statement that they don't exist, then we need to look at something else, some different kind of a process. So this didn't work. Um, and one thing you could do is to look at the Schwinger process. And this is what um, we did with my former student, Oliver Gould, a few years ago. Yeah. Is there any model in which uh, collisions could be optimized for that? Um, if you have any finite number of uh, of particles just colliding randomly, you have the same problem. In a certain very specific way, a uh, Schwinger process is a collision of an infinite number of particles, which doesn't suffer, suffer from that problem. So in that sense, yes. But, um, but you need, the, the key problem is, the key problem here um, in the, with the elephants is that, Whatever you do, if you collide stuff, you are going to be producing a huge number of quanta and you need something that um, wins over the entropy and picks out the elephants, or in our case, the monopoles, out of the zillions of different configurations that you, you are otherwise going to produce. There they need to be something that's going to favor specifically elephants or specifically magnetic monopoles. And the Schwinger process makes use of precisely that. So the Schwinger process, uh, the, the standard Schwinger process, was actually discovered by, um, by Sauter in 1931. And uh, Heisenberg and Euler wrote about that five years later, and then Schwinger 20 years later, but somehow it's still called the Schwinger process. Um, it's, it's a pair electron-positron pair production in strong electric field. And it's basically quantum tunneling. Uh, if you think of a, a virtual electron-positron pair, uh, energy as a function of distance uh, looks like this, if it's in an electric field, because at short distance they got the Coulomb interaction, and at short distance, you've, uh, at long distance, you've got the uh, electric field, which is trying to pull them apart. Um, this is a potential barrier, and you can ask what uh, the tunneling rate through that is. And that um, tunneling rate, uh, it's, well, at zero temperature, it's tunneling. And if you're at high, sufficiently high temperature, you can have a Sphaleron process, which is uh, that you go over this. And then it's, uh, determined, uh, the rate is determined by the height of the, of the potential barrier. So at finite temperature, it's a thermal activation where the rate is exponential of Sphaleron energy divided by temperature. Sphaleron energy can be easily computed and it's that. And at zero temperature, it's, um, it's a quantum tunneling process, which you can compute in many different ways. But uh, the way that is um, uh, most useful for us is uh, using a work line instanton, uh, which was done by Affleck, Alvarez and Manton. So um, instantons describe this kind of tunneling processes. The rate of the, 
of the process is given as exponential of minus the action of the instanton. And um, in this case, it turns out that the instanton in the world line formalism that you need is just a, the, the solution is just a circle. And that was found by Affleck, Alvarez, and Manton. Um, circle with this radius, and um, the action is then easy to compute, and it has this form where the second term comes from uh, the Coulomb interaction between uh, the electron and the positron, the first term comes from the external field. And um, you um, put that in here and you get, you can even calculate the prefactor. In this case, it's relatively straightforward. And so you can calculate the rate um, and it has this form. And what is important about this is that at no stage in this calculation did they have to assume that E, uh, the charge, is small. So this is not a perturbative calculation, it's a completely non-perturbative. It's a semi-classical um, approximation, it's basically a saddle point approximation of the path integral, but that only requires that the field is weak in this sense. And so therefore, uh, this is a, a non-perturbative process. You can calculate the rate without using perturbation theory, and we even know for the constant uniform field, uh, what the uh, uh, what the expression uh, is, and um, so this is for uh, electron-positron pairs in electric field. But then we can use the electromagnetic duality, if you, if uh, that, uh, which tells us that uh, the rate of producing magnetically charged particles in a constant and uniform magnetic field is just the same thing. You just have to replace everything electric by um, the same corresponding magnetic quantity. And so therefore, uh, the rate for pair production of magnetic monopoles in a constant and uniform magnetic field is given by this expression, where G is the magnetic charge and B is the magnetic field strength. The, and this is valid even though G is large, because there is no assumption anywhere that uh, G was small. But uh, the large uh, coupling, so strong coupling, um, is important because it means that the second term here, uh, g squared over 4, is now actually a large positive um, uh, term, whereas for the electric uh, Schwinger process it's a small correction, but here now it actually means that the interactions of the monopoles enhance the production significantly um, by a very large uh, fraction. And um, so what this means is that we need, uh, in order to produce monopoles, we need a magnetic field which is sufficiently strong that this exponent here uh, vanishes, which means that uh, the first term becomes as large um, as the second term. And, uh, and, um, and uh, that gives us the field strength, uh, which is m squared, where m is the mass of the magnetic monopole, divided by g cubed, where g is the magnetic charge, which for a single Dirac charge is 20.7. And so what this is telling us is that if we can reach this kind of magnetic field, then we start to, we, we, the theory predicts that, and, and, and if magnetic monopoles exist, this monopole and monopole pairs start to pop out of the vacuum. Um, this calculation is, uh, so there are lots of, uh, no, not, then, number of very specific assumptions that go into this calculation. Um, one is that the field is constant and uniform. The other one in this specific calculation is that this is, because uh, it's based on the world line instanton, it's assuming that uh, the, the particles are point-like. So this specific result here is for the point-like um, point -like Dirac monopoles. So you could ask, what does the finite size of the monopoles do? How does that change the result? But that even that is relatively straightforward to do. Now, then you just, instead of the world line instanton, you take the full field theory, the uh, SU2 uh, with the adjoint scalar field, and find the corresponding uh, solution in that. Now, it's just a field theory instanton, or sphaleron. And um, with my student, David Howe, uh, we first looked at uh, Svaleron, 
Svaleron is always a bit easier to find than the than the instant. And so Svaleron is a is a is an unstable classical solution in three dimensions. Um, and um, we found it for uh, SU2 adjoint scalar, and um, they look like this. So this is like a monopole antimonopole pair um, with some separation. When we increase the field strength, so this is the field strength. When we increase it, you can see that they uh, start to merge into one blob. So you can no longer um, identify the precise position of the monopole and the antimonopole. And, um, and that's when the point like ap approximation is, is starting to fail. And Oh, these here. These are the, uh, the magnetic uh, field, uh, field lines, the direction of the magnetic fields uh, across the center of the, of the, of the instant one. Oh yes, yes, that's right. But they are not. Um, yeah, you you can. Yes, you can. Um, well, what I mean is that the solution doesn't look like two point particles, but it's a blob. We, it's a blob which has a magnetic dipole, um, and um, so you can still sort of uh, see where the monopole and and, um, and antimonopole are, but they are not sort of point point like um, uh, objects. And yeah. Um, I would have to think about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and what happens also is that so I'm giving this in units of a critical field. So, what happens is that if it's, and this is point eight, and we can already see that uh, instead of two. Uh, point like monopoles, we just have this one a relatively shallow um, blob there. And what happens is that actually if we go to sufficiently high uh, field strength, then the action goes to zero. And we even know precisely where that action goes to zero. It, it is what's known as the uh, lower ambient and Ullesen critical field. It's exactly mv squared over e, where mv is the mass of the vector particle in this theory, electrically charged vector particle in this theory. And so when, um, when the field strength is this high, then uh, the Svaleron energy goes to zero, which means that there is no classical barrier. There's, there's no potential barrier anymore for um, production of magnetic monopoles. Instead, so it's, not, it's then no longer even a tunneling process. It's just a classical instability. If you reach this field strength, then um, the vacuum becomes classically unstable uh, to production of magnetic monopoles. Uh, as an aside here, so what is the ambient Nullesen field? So they found they looked at the electroweak theory and they found that there are two two uh, uh, field a magnetic field strengths that are important. Uh, the lower one uh, is this, and that's the analog of what, uh, what I was talking about. And uh, that field strength, they found that the vacuum state of, uh, of the electroweak theory becomes um, a vortex lattice. So the, it's no longer um, uniform. Instead, you get uh, a field which is slightly above this, you start to see a um, little uh, variation in a sort of regular lattice pattern where the magnetic field in some bits it's stronger and the other parts it is it's weaker so the magnetic field is not uniform when you go above this field strength and then when you increase the field even further to this uh, where this is just the, the Higgs the physical Higgs uh, mass squared over E so five times 10 to the power four GV squared, then um, the 
uh, the electrophoric symmetry gets restored by the magnetic field. Now, this is in, in the um, case with adjoint Higgs, things are, things are different, but uh, the, uh, the monopole, um, the place where the, uh, the, the Svaleron energy for the monopole production goes to zero is the same as the analog of the lower critical field. Now, what that means is that there's no potential barrier for uh, monopole pair production. And that's now uh, interesting because then you imagine that then the process must be happening fast and they, you, don't need a, you don't need quantum tunneling for that. So you would expect that the instanton, so instanton describe quantum tunneling, that the instanton action should vanish at the same point. But the instanton and the Svaleron solutions are instanton solution is a classical solution in four dimensions. It's just a very different beast from uh, the Svaleron. So it's not at all obvious that the, that the instanton action and the Svaleron energy vanish at the same field strength. But so therefore we decided to look at this and, and this is what the instantons look like for different field strengths. If you are a weak field, remember this is the analog of the world line instanton, which was a circle, world line of a particle going around a circle. So when we are at a, a sufficiently weak field, the instanton looks like a donut. So it's not a thick particle, but it's still like a circle. But when we increase the field uh, further, the whole of the donut gets filled and eventually it just becomes one blob. And um, so the same thing as we saw with the, uh, with the, uh, with the Svaleron. And so this is not shown in the clearest way, but um, what we find that indeed uh, the uh, instant on action goes to zero at sufficiently at strong fields and the field strength where it vanishes is again given by uh, the, the lower ambient nullescent field, which is the, the dashed lines here. And so this confirms that the quantum process, uh, also the action and the rate of the quantum process becomes large at the same point. And so therefore really the, the quantum and the classical calculation both agree that when we reach that field strength, then monopoles will be produced uh, with no suppression, no exponential suppression at all. Sorry, can you go back to the part that we had to Yeah. Uh, can you see the analogy of what you mentioned before, that it's kind of like the electric symmetry is broken, but if you increase the energy, the symmetry is still, is that kind of... These are, these are still below the, um, uh, the lower field. So if you go, you have to go, um, higher and in fact so in the no I think it's still the case yeah so if, if you go to the so the electrovic symmetry or in this case the SU2 symmetry gets restored when you reach the um, the higher the upper ambient nullescent field so we are we are still well below oh, that yeah, here yeah even the top line because this is uh, the big crit here is the lower um, lower um, ambient nullescent field Okay, so these are, um, this is how magnetic monopoles are produced in strong fields. And what we therefore are seeing is, uh, is that both the classical and the quantum process are agreeing that if you get field strength of this, um, magnetic fields of this strength, uh, then magnetic monopoles uh, will, be, will be produced. And, um, and I stress here that this is now not, a, there is no reliance on perturbation theory in this. Let me ask you mm. a simple question. So if I were to, let's say, look at the analogy of this for GPU, right? Mm. Where the so this is specifically the vector boson that's um, associated um, with the same symmetry breaking that is responsible for the existence of the, of the monopoles. So they are so intrinsically um, uh, uh, tied to, uh, together. Um, when you have the Dirac monopoles, then um, which you could, you could uh, 
you could um, ask just generally what uh, is it could these are specifically the tooth polycoff monopoles that we are talking about for the point like Dirac monopoles I haven't got that uh, that here you should have that in this plot but the action actually goes it it's it follows very much the same line but it actually goes I think actually this might be it yeah sorry this is the, this is the yeah the, the the black line here is what happens if you just take the um, the point like um, a point like uh, monopoles rather than the, the solitonic tooth polycoff monopoles. You can see action is lower for the uh, for the solitonic monopoles, so it means that the process is enhanced, but it's uh, roughly behaving in the same way. Um, right. So the other process I wanted to talk about. I hope I still have. Uh, Good, yeah. Um, so the other process I wanted to talk about, uh, and I will come back uh, to monopoles later when I talk about how we could potentially reach these kind of magnetic fields. But uh, for now, let's leave that aside and come back to that later. So the other process I wanted to talk about was baryon number conservation or baryon number violation. So empirically, baryon number is very much conserved. Um, uh, the the bounds for uh, this a specific process for super Kamiokande is uh, that the proton lifetime is more than five times 10 to the power 33 years. And even if you don't assume a, a, any, any a, a particular process or dark decays where you don't even know what uh, a proton is decaying into, the lifetimes are um, 10 to the power uh, 29 years. And so we know that um, a proton is very much stable uh, so if baryon number is violated, it is very, very weakly violated. Um, and indeed, perturbatively, it is conserved in, in the standard model. But also we know that somehow it must have been violated in the early universe, because today I'm made of matter, I'm made of baryons, not antibaryons. You are all made of baryons. Everything we see around is made of baryons. There's no very few antibaryons around in cosmic rays sometimes. But, but um, so the universe has a big asymmetry between matter and antimatter. And especially if we believe, as it seems to be the case, that there was a period of inflation after which the universe was basically empty, then at that point, there, if there was no matter or antimatter, there can't have been an asymmetry between those and therefore the asymmetry must have uh, been produced at some point after inflation. And that's only possible if there is a process that violates baryon number conservation. Because if at the end of inflation, baryon number was zero, it would be zero today. So empirically, therefore, we've got very strong indirect evidence for baryon number violation, but no direct evidence at all. And in the standard model, as I said, baryon number is actually, so it's perturbatively conserved, but non-perturbatively it is violated. And that's through the chiral anomaly, um, um, which um, gives you a relation uh, that uh, the uh, baryon number, change of baryon number is related to the change of the chern simons number, which is a topological uh, quantity in your gauge field. And if you have any process in which the churn simons number changes, then uh, the baryon number will change by three times uh, that. So if the churn simons number is a topological quantity, it's an integer. So if it changes by one, then baryon number will change by three. And, um, and um, if you had no fermions in the theory, then the churn simons, then the vacua, this, uh, then the states with different churn simons number are, are identical. You can do a gauge transformation to, to relate them to each other. And in that case, therefore, the energy of uh, vacua with different churn simons number is the same. But we do have um, fermions and we do have baryons and baryons have a mass. And so therefore, um, the, um, the vacuum 
with a baryon number one has a higher energy than the vacuum with baryon number zero and the difference is precisely the mass of the proton and so on so because this 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 vacuum has one proton this has two protons and so on and so therefore um we've got this situation where the different uh, the vacuum with different turn Simons numbers are not um not degenerate they are non-degenerate and they differ precisely by the proton mass Um, also, so the, so the Turnsamos number, I should have said this, it's quantized only in the vacuum state. And so therefore in non-vacuum configurations, it can be non-zero. And therefore one can meaningfully ask what is the, um, what is the minimum energy for any given Turnsamos number, even non-integer one. And so therefore you basically have this kind of a, a potential, almost periodic potential in which the Turnsamos number uh, uh, energy as a function of churn Simon's number, where the lowest is uh, corresponds to a uh, vacuum with zero baryon number, then you have a barrier, and then you have a baryon number, actually because it's changed by three, that's baryon number three, and so on. Um, and the barrier between the vacua has a finite height, and the top there is the sphaleron. It, this is in fact the original Svaleron that Klinghammer and Manton found and they came up with the name, but now I'm using this, the word Svaleron for any top of a barrier, like for the monopole case. And so therefore, in the same way as before, um, the rate at finite temperature for barrier number violation would be proportional to exponential of minus uh, Svaleron energy over temperature. And at zero temperature, uh, you, you would be looking at um, quantum tunneling between uh, the different minima. Um, at zero field, uh, this, uh, the, uh, the Svaleron energy has been calculated, so you can find the top of the barrier calculated energy, and it's roughly 9 TeV for the, uh, for the standard model. So you need that kind of energy, that kind of temperature, and then you can start to have these transitions. Um, the other thing that was found early on by Klinghammer was that the Svaleron has a non-zero magnetic dipole moment. And that's interesting for us, because what that means um, then is just that uh, if you put it in, a, if you take a Svaleron, which has in zero field, it has this energy, you put it in a, in a magnetic field, then its energy goes down. That's what the magnetic dipole moment does. And so therefore, by, uh, with an external magnetic field, you lower the barrier between uh, the, the, the vacua and therefore um, can enhance the transition rate. And the question is how much? Well, in order to do that, you need to find the Svaleron in magnetic field, in a strong magnetic field, and see how, the, how this behaves. And uh, this is very much the same kind of a calculation. I mean, the theory is different. We are now using the electroweak theory rather than the SU2 and an adjoint, but the calculation is basically the same as before, and that's why the plots look very similar as well. So we found uh, the Svaleron um, that, uh, for, that describes the, the, the top of the barrier that uh, describes the classical transition, the thermal transitions between the vacua e as a function of the magnetic field. Zero field, it is um, almost spherical, as you would expect, but then you start, see so when you put it in, a, in an external field, the field starts to stretch it, it becomes this kind of a longer ellipsoid, but what is um, uh, more important for us is how the energy changes, because the energy tells us uh, how that gives us the rate of these processes. And the energy decreases uh, with the field strength. When we get to the lower ambient field, the behavior changes significantly, but it doesn't vanish at this field. It, but it goes to zero at the upper ambient field, which is for the standard model, it's 5.2 times 10 to the 4 GV squared. At that field strength, therefore, there is no longer any classical barrier 
to baryon number violation. If you can have uh, that kind of field strength magnetic field, you put um, um, uh, some baryons in it, then they can uh, decay without any, any uh, exponential uh, suppression. Now you have to be careful here because baryon number can change only by you by uh, units of three, and so therefore if you have a proton baryon number one, it can't decay. But if you put in a if you take a, a helium nucleus and put that in a strong enough magnetic field, then um, you it can decay, and um, so therefore that's the kind of thing that you would you would expect to see. Sorry, that hasn't been done. And, and also, so this is telling us that there is no exponential suppression coming from the, uh, from the tunneling rate. But of course, uh, there's a big calculation one would need to do to, to, to what the prefactor is, and therefore what's the precise, uh, how, how, how fast would you expect the, uh, the helium uh, nucleus to decay? So that we don't know yet, but, um, but at least there's no um, uh, suppression coming from uh, the tunneling rate. Right, so, um, so then the question is indeed, does, does this mean that when you put helium uh, nucleus in a, in a strong field, uh, does it decay? Does the uh, baryon number violation rate uh, really become unsuppressed? The, uh, there's a, so what we were looking at was the, was the Svaleron. That's telling us that there's no classical energy barrier. The other thing which um, one needs is, is to see whether there is the same kind of entropy problem still as there was with monopole production um, in uh, particle collisions. And, and that we can, uh, one way to approach that is to ask whether the uh, whether the young meals, sorry, uh, whether, whether, the, whether the instanton rate is, um, is also vanishing at that point. Because you could have, a, in principle, you can have a situation where the instanton uh, action is still, still non-zero, in which case the zero temperature process is, um, is still exponentially suppressed. And that would at least indicate, that would be a hint that that actually what's going on is that even though the classical barrier has disappeared, the, uh, the probability of these events happening is still suppressed. And that would require a calculation of, uh, require us to find the instantons rather than the sphalerons. And the instantons are harder to find because they are four-dimensional um, uh, four um, solutions rather than three-dimensional. Now, if you take just the pure young meals, then instanton is, the instanton solution is easy to find. It was found by Belavin collaborators and by Toft in 1970s, and the action is eight pi squared over g squared. But uh, now what we are interested in is what if we've got the electroweak theory, which is not just the SU2, but it also has the U1 factor, and importantly, it has the scalar field, it has the Higgs field in it. Uh, with the uh, introduction of the Higgs field, you get a serious problem because there's a <coughs> simple scaling argument which tells you that there can't be any actual uh, solution, instant on solution. Uh, because <coughs> a solution is a saddle point, it would correspond to a, um, uh, so, uh, it's, it's a saddle point solution. Uh, but uh, what uh, one can show easily is that if you have the scalar field, then you take any solution and you scale the physical size of the solution, you shrink it, you make it smaller, the action decreases. And therefore, means that there can't be any saddle point solution, because the saddle point solution uh, would not have this property. This was um, realized early on and Affleck showed how one gets around this and instead in this kind of a situation one needs to consider what's known as a constraint instanton. One needs to introduce a constraint in the path integral 
and um, then integrate over that constraint. Uh, the constraint can be whatever you want as long as it uh, it uh, it works in the sense that it gives you it it fixes the scaling of the solution and therefore allows you to find the solution and then you integrate over that constraint. And so what we did, what we are doing with my student Kinga uh, Gavrich is a, we are doing this in practice. So we choose this constraint. So it's a high dimensional operator in the action. Um, but um, what it does is that it prevents the uh, scaling argument it means that if you try to shrink the solution because this has the derivative terms uh, the, the derivatives here if you try to make it physically smaller the derivatives become bigger and it will um, uh, it, it will mean that the action starts to increase it does but we integrate over it so it's not actually there in the theory we are not changing the theory we are putting in a delta function um, with is for the value of this constraint and then we integrate over it so so yes uh, it would not be renormalizable if we just add this to the action but it's uh, we are putting it in but then we are integrating over it so that that uh, that that would then get rid of it so Two is not enough, and uh, two is not enough because because you need the derivatives to stop the uh, to uh, to make sure that you can't shrink it uh, to zero size. You can see that there's four powers, four positive powers of length here, and you, you need um, more than four negative powers of length. Uh, coming from uh, the operator itself. If you, if this was squared, then there would be four uh, derivatives, and that's so that's not enough. You need you need more, and that's why it's a it's a it's a third power. Now this works. Uh, it allows us to fix the uh, size. Uh, we can calculate the uh, the action as a function of the constraint, and then um, we can in principle integrate over the constraint now in this case this is still with zero external magnetic field and what we find is that the action is very different so very very similar to the young mills action which is the this is the orange line here and therefore actually the presence of the higgs field it increases the action slightly but um, it doesn't have a big effect here however uh, the uh, really the thing that we want to do is see what happens when we add the magnetic external magnetic field and that's um, and that's only possible I mean, the whole concept of the magnetic field requires the u1 factor uh, and so therefore we also then need to include the u1 uh, gauge field but most importantly the magnetic field uh, breaks the spherical symmetry of the solutions because it has a direction, magnetic field has a direction, and that means that the calculation becomes a, a lot harder, and therefore we haven't got any results for that case yet. And this is more just an illustration of how the calculation would proceed, but um, we haven't got to the, really, uh, to the case with external magnetic fields yet. On the hmm. Why is it not linear? Why, why are you doing Um, uh, it's because we are implementing the constraint by using a Lagrange multiplier. So we've got a, um, we do the calculation using a Lagrange multiplier uh, parameter kappa, and then kappa is with uh, fixed intervals, but then we compute for any, any value of kappa, we compute psi and they are not uh, fixed intervals because it's psi is computed from the solution it's not what is put in um, okay good so this is just to show that the calculation is in progress and at some stage we will uh, we will be able to say 
whether whether the uh, quantum tunneling process also becomes unsuppressed at the same point. However, let me now go to the you're asking about the actual field strengths. Um, so, so what kind of field strengths would we need in order to see these processes? So I've, I've, I've told you that if you have sufficiently strong magnetic field and if magnetic monopoles exist, then um, sufficiently strong magnetic field would see them being produced, pop popping out of the vacuum. And also if, um, if you have magnetic fields which are as strong as, as this in natural units, then barrier number violation becomes at least unsuppressed in, ter in the terms of the uh, quantum mechanical uh, uh, tunneling factor in the, in the rate. So what are the strengths uh, needed? Of course, so for magnetic monopoles, it depends on the, on the monopole mass. Uh, whereas for the barrier number violation, we know all the parameters and therefore we can give uh, the value in GV squared. Now for comparison, um, the LHC magnets, which are among the strongest magnets that have been made, and they, they are not the strongest, obviously, but uh, they are so, the, the, the strongest magnets uh, that have been built are not hugely more powerful than they are. They are roughly 10 Tesla, which in natural units is 10 to power minus 15 GV squared. So we are 19 orders of magnitude below what's needed for barrier number violation. But it is still, for magnetic monopoles, it still sort of gives you the first result from the LHC. Because at the time when they just switched on the magnets, even before any collisions took place, the fact that when they switched on the magnets, they didn't produce a large number of magnetic monopoles, uh, that tells us that the monopole mass must be at least um, 1.5 uh, kilo electron volts, depending on the charge. But uh, if, if, if they are single Dirac charge, then 1.5 keV. If monopoles uh, lighter than that existed, they would have been produced at the moment uh, they switched on the magnets. Now, these are not the strongest magnetic fields in the universe. Uh, uh, there are very strong magnetic fields in some neutron stars. In fact, the class of neutron stars that have the strongest magnetic fields is known as magnetars. And their field strengths go up to 10 to power 11 Tesla, which is 10 to minus 4 GV squared. Again, that's still far below, it's eight orders of magnitude uh, below what's needed for barium number violation. But again, you can use that to place a constraint on the monopole mass, because if, um, if monopoles that are so light that they would be produced in this field, they, if, if they existed, then they would be produced there. And when they are produced by the Schwinger process, then uh, the field strength would decrease because the energy uh, for the mass of the monopoles would be taken from the field. And therefore, when we observe the field strengths, we would not see this, but we would see something, something lower. So the fact that we can, uh, we can see that the, they still have this kind of field strength, it tells us that um, um, monopoles with mass less than roughly 1 GV can't exist because otherwise they would have been produced and that would have uh, reduced the field strength. And actually at the time when we pointed this out, this was, there was no other bound on the monopole mass that was uh, independent of assumptions about what happens in collisions or so on. So this was the, this was the, at the time this was the strongest bound which is just on the mass, in, independently of the, of the microscopic details of the monopoles or any assumptions about per perturbation theory or something. For this, yeah, uh, strictly speaking, yes, but for this, um, um, uh, in this case, this is, these fields are so weak that, uh, that actually you'd, uh, 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 you, the, um, the point, point like all the tooth product of um, bounds would be would be very much the same. 
But yet, so the strongest magnetic fields in the universe that we know, apart from very early, early moments of the universe, but in the present day universe, are at the LHC when they do heavy ion collisions. So, in a heavy ion collision, they take two lead nuclei, which then collide almost at the speed of light. Um, the collision energy is 5 uh, TeV, or was 5 TeV in the last uh, round. Um, when you have an ultra peripheral collision, which is when the when the um, when the nuclei don't actually hit each other, they fly past each other at a short distance. That that's the case that we are most interested in because in that case there is no actual collision. Everything is very nice and clean, but in the space between the the two mono, uh, two, two two nuclei, at the time um, of the closest approach when they're closest to each other, you you have very very strong magnetic field because these um, uh, nuclei have a strong electric charge around 100 um, uh, uh, protons. So they, and they are flying past each other at the speed of light. So you have very strong uh, electric currents going in opposite directions. So between them, you've got a very strong uh, magnetic field. And the field strength in these ultra peripheral uh, heavy ion collisions uh, is seven GV squared. Now you can see that that is still the that's a maximum filtering. That's still sadly less than what's needed for baryon number violation, but it gives us uh, interesting bounds for the monopoles. Uh, the the complication here is that uh, the field is highly time dependent. So it is this is the maximum, but it's at this order only for a time of uh, 1 over 73 uh, GV, so inverse time of 73 GV. So it's a very short pulse, but it's a very strong pulse. Uh, and that complicates the calculation. The nice results from um, Africa, Alvarez and Manton are for constant uniform field. But we do have ways of incorporating, and at least try to incorporate the time dependence, and based on that, um, um, I mean, this kind of search was done in 2018 when there was a heavy iron run and no monopoles were produced. Obviously, you would have heard uh, if, they, if they were. Um, but because they were not produced, we can see that we can conclude from the calculation that um, monopoles with mass less than 75 uh, GV can't exist because otherwise they would have been produced. Um, this was uh, the heavy iron run in 2018. There was a new heavy iron run um, last November, November last year. Uh, the, the way, the mod I'm a member of the metal experiment, the way it works is that uh, we don't know if monopoles were produced because the detector consists of a ton of aluminium and we have to physically go there, remove the aluminium and scan it with um, with squid magnetometers to see if there are monopoles trapped in it. And so therefore we haven't done that yet for last year's um, run. Monopoles can't decay because they have a magnetic charge. So if they get trapped, they, are stay, they, are, they will stay there. They're absolutely stable because they have a magnetic charge and that's conserved. So basically what that means is that from this uh, 2018 run, we get, um, get uh, a bound which compared to, so the neutron star bound is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is here the, um, the, the green curve. There was an earlier lead lead uh, uh, run in SPS, I think 1990s, and uh, so that would have given this kind of bounce, and now we are talking about 75 um, GV. Uh, the complication here is time dependence, and uh, so we had to make some simplifying assumptions in order to uh, try to, and we try to be very conservative with the assumptions we, uh, we make about time dependence. Um, 
because uh, doing the instant on calculation in a time dependent background is hard. But actually, um, at least for the point like monopoles, it is, it is it, it's sort of doable. I mean, we know how to do it. We can do it. Um, um, so there's basically one, one thing is that one can um, take all of the parameters that describe the collision and it all boils down to one uh, dimension less number, which, um, which is known as the Keldish uh, parameter, um, uh, which we do not like psi. Uh, which is which is this combination that's dimensionless and that tells us how time dependent the the process is and if it's if psi is in its constant field and then uh, the instant on solution is a circle if psi the larger it is the more time dependent it is and um, if we if we ignore the self interactions of the monopoles, then it's easy to find the solutions and they are just ellipses. Uh, we can easily write down what the solutions are. And in that case, can we also see that the production at large psi, the production um, uh, 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 probability actually doesn't even depend on the field strength. It only depends on the, on the duration of the pulse, as long as the field strength is sufficiently strong. Yeah, that's right. So, so this is this is from the what you call the free particle approximation, where we are, we are ignoring it, and it's not a good approximation. But that's that's a calculation that one can do. However, um, we can improve that calculation. So this is uh, the uh, the red curve here, and this is the action as a function of psi. Now, for the LHC, we really would like to go to forty. Now, as I said, for the, uh, if you ignore the self-interactions, it's easy to do, and we get the, the red curve. We can calculate leading order corrections from the time dependence. Uh, that gives us the, the green curve, which, um, which you can see that it's below, it's always below the, um, the uh, the red curve, and that's the same thing that we saw with the Affleck Alvarez Manton result. The interaction term, the g squared over 4, is positive, so the interactions enhance the rate, and we see that that's, the, that's true here as well. However, um, this is the, the green curve is only uh, the leading term in the expansion, and so it's, it, it's not to all orders. We can't analytically do it to all orders. And um, what we can do numerically, we can, uh, in principle, find the instant on solutions uh, without any any assumptions to all orders, and that is the uh, that's the blue curve. And you can see that the blue curve agrees very well with uh, with the green curve. So it looks like, at least for small psi, uh, the that the leading order um, result works works well, and therefore we could choose to use it. However, and I said we wanted to be conservative in our assumptions, because the leading order result is always predicting more monopoles than uh, the, uh, the one where we, the, than the free particle approximation, we felt that what we will use is the free particle approximation. That way, um, we are not overestimating the probability of, uh, of monopole pair production. So therefore, in the analysis, that's what we use. Uh, even though we know it's not actually a very good approximation, we know that if we could do the calculation properly, we'd get stronger bounds because we would uh, have more, um, we, 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 our calculations would predict more uh, monopoles. So this is just to, just to say that it's important to get this right and even without doing any more experiments if we were able to do the full calculation then our bounds would probably improve by a factor of two or so okay so um so this is the lhc it allows us to go to uh, 75 gv 
but there are still many orders of magnitude away from a baryon number violation. Could we do, can we do better in the future? And of course, so one thing which we are hopefully will have one day is, the, is FCC, the Future Circular Collider at CERN. Maybe there will be others in China or elsewhere. Um, what we, we, can, we can ask here, for example, what field strength are we going to need? Or we know what field strength we need for baryon number violations. So how much energy do we need from our heavy ion collisions uh, in order to reach that kind of field uh, strength? And it's very easy to calculate the peak field strength. Um, is roughly this, where the only thing that really changes is gamma, which is the Lorentz um, factor of the, of the nuclei. And from that we get that um, in order to reach this field strength, <coughs> we need a 35 beta electron volts. FCC, if there's a hadronic FCC, which I hope there will be, um, that would give us 100, roughly 100, TV. So you can see we are still quite far off. So we need something bigger than uh, FCC. So how big? Um, uh, there was a paper uh, in 2021 um, by Beecham and Zimmerman when they, when they were sort of saying, so what's the biggest thing you could imagine ever building? And so they came up with a circular collider on the moon. So you could build a collider around the whole moon and if you because that's obviously a nice circle and no one is living there so therefore it's it's you know you you can do that in principle um, and if you take the current technology of magnets that are being used at the LHC then uh, they find that you would get uh, 14 uh, peta electron volts and you can see that that's that's only a factor of two below what's needed so Surely by the time uh, we start to build uh, the circular collider on the moon, then the magnets are going to be that much stronger so that we can reach a 35 peta electron volts and that way get a baryon number um, violation on the moon. And that's probably the best place to do this experiment because you don't want to start a chain reaction which, which uh, then destroys the whole Earth. Uh, but um, but yes, so obviously uh, it's going to take some time to convince politicians that they, they should go this big. But uh, if someone really wanted to have baryon number violation, uh, then this is basically saying that this is the way to do it. And with the current technology, it's in principle doable. There's nothing, I mean, we have been to the moon. Um, we can build these magnets, just need lots of them in a in a circle. I think that they, they actually looked at various kinds of considerations. I'm not sure whether they looked at that. One thing they were calculating is how you would uh, get the power to run it uh, using solar panels and so they were saying that that's doable and so on. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Anyway, so that's uh, still sometime in the future. So this is uh, just to summarize. So what I have shown is that strong magnetic fields, at least in principle, open up the door to new kind of uh, phenomena, non-perturbative phenomena in familiar theories, in the standard model or extensions, grand unified theories and so on. And uh, they can lead uh, to monopole production or baryon number violation. And uh, with monopole production, it of course depends on whether monopoles exist or not. And uh, so all we can, we won't produce monopoles if they don't exist. But with baryon number violation, on the other hand, this is a prediction of the standard model. And so therefore, if we have a, a really solid calculation, then um, we can say for sure that it must happen if you do uh, these collisions. However, currently our calculations are not quite as solid as that, so more theoretical work is needed, especially to make sure that we really understand the effect of the time dependence. Um, so that's where we are focusing our efforts um, now. Thank you.
Sorry, from? From one instance. Normally, when you have an instance process, you have, uh, for young instance, you have a Oh, yeah, multi instance, yes. Yeah, true. Yeah. 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 So if it's in 30 to the minus something, you have one, then you have a twin instance, the same one. True. Yes. I think. Yeah, this is one of the things one would then need to um, need to do very carefully. And so, so basically, I'm not, sure, I'm not even sure if I've got any good slide I can I can use here. But um, but yes. So um, what we can what we can say is that when we are when we are up here where the action is high, then the single instant on is perfectly adequate, and then we know that there is an exponential suppression. When, um, when we go up here, where the action goes to zero, then what we can say is that that exponential suppression has, has gone. But it's a then completely different question is then what is the actual rate in that case? And that needs a, needs a careful calculation. And we are not at that stage where we would be able to say that. But what we know is that, and there may be other, other, other sources of big suppression. I think that someone needs to bear that in mind, that even though there wouldn't be um, this, this kind of exponential factor, which is the same as the, as the elephant factor. So, so to this, this factor would have gone, but there may be other factors that are small. And so one does need a, a, a complete calculation in order to to really make a, a precise statement, um, what in the in the in the LHC collisions that we analyzed, however, um, the the bound comes from because basically there are lots of collisions. So therefore, even if the rate was relatively low, we would have produced at least one monopole. And we haven't seen any, and so that, therefore the the bound, the 75 GV bound, actually comes from a case where the instant on action is is not zero, but it is um, maybe 10 or something like that. And in that case, you you can at least to some extent believe the the single instant on result. So therefore, it would affect um, a lot of detailed things, especially at strong fields, but uh, for the specific experimental bounds that we are getting, it probably doesn't as long as you've got enough, enough uh, uh, collisions in your sample. Do you have any data on how strong the magnetic tools will be at the electric weak Sorry, at the electric phase transition? Yeah. Well, that depends very much on your cosmological scenario. And uh, so, so they are, I don't know what, what constraints there are. I'm looking at you, <laughs> you know. And, but, um, but yes, I think that's a, so I think it certainly is the case that in the early universe, um, it, they, you can have, um, you can have scenarios where you get very strong magnetic fields. And therefore, these kind of things could have been relevant there. The, the kind of things to look at is, is whether, I mean, is that, is that natural? Is it, a, is it a viable theory in other ways? Are there other constraints, empirical constraints, that, um, uh, that put an upper bound on the magnetic fields? But in principle, it's quite easy to come up with scenarios that would produce strong magnetic fields in the early universe. And what this is also saying to some extent is that it can be important for um, for baryogenesis during the electroweak phase transition. If, if you have electroweak baryogenesis, uh, the magnetic fields would need to be taken into account. Thank you. Sure again, why you chose the constraints for XI? I read that it was 
was ranked third. Yeah. Why divide white has this form? Or why do, why do we put it in? So, yeah. So, so this one, right. So there's a scaling argument which, which we want to overcome. Let me first, just, I think it's probably good to, to just explain what we mean by the constraint. So, so we've got the path integral that we are sort of trying to compute, which, um, which would be, uh, would be uh, this and um, in general uh, you would um, let me put the minus there so we've done the um, a big rotation to um, to uh, to Euclidean time and so this would the saddle point approximation would be would be just to say that this is exponential of minus uh, the saddle point if the saddle point exists in this case um, it does not exist because there's the scaling argument which is saying that um, by uh, reducing the physical size of your configuration you can always make the accent smaller now what afflex uh, solution to this is is basically that you put in uh, you put in a constraint which is saying that you've got some um, uh, observable some operator xi which in our case is that and we fix it to to some value which i denote like xi bar here okay and then we need to integrate over over uh, the value of the construct and this is not changing anything but now within this constraint theory if you've if you've chosen a good uh, constraint here uh, then we can we can um, use the saddle point approximation and then we integrate over that and then the question is what is a good choice of the of the constraint and so this one is because um, um, we want something that when we try to make things we want to make make it smaller so without the constraint the action always decreases and that's that, that was the problem so when something we want a term that will um, will start to uh, increase when we make make the um, make the size smaller and therefore we need something which has negative uh, powers of, of length and so therefore we have here we have uh, uh, four positive powers we need at least we need more than four derivatives to counter that and we've got six and so that um, that means that uh, when we try to make things smaller then the value of the constraint increases and uh, and that stops uh, that means that we we get a um this is essentially a uh, a force that prevents us from making it making it arbitrarily small and the other thing is that so the way we do this in practice rather than uh, a constraint as such we implement the constraint so now uh, the saddle point approximation is then the minimum of the action subject to a constraint but then we use the Lagrange multiplier rather than explicit constraint because that's more convenient and so so therefore actually in practice in the calculation what we are what we are using is um, we are finding saddle points of of that action uh, which has kappa times xi where kappa is the is the, is the Lagrange multiplier Um, uh, not really, because because this is this is really the same uh, path integral as that. So this is this is more like um, fixing the gauge. Uh, it's a just put, put put in a delta function and we integrate over that. 
So we are not actually changing the theory, but we are, we are writing it in a way that allows us to use the saddle point approximation. Um, I, I think for practical calculations it needs to be needs to be an integer so that you can you can um, find I guess how you how, how you do this but so what we are doing is we are finding it, we take this action then and we find the other Lagrange equation the equations of motion from this and certainly you want for that you want um, this to be an analytic a polynomial function but I think if you if you had some fully numerical way of minimizing of, of finding the saddle points then I think you could do do other things as well Yeah. Then there I understand the argument and why it's collapsing in one post. You would have uh, yeah. the collapsing in one post. But financially, and in that case, you don't have any type of argument with the compound. Hmm. When you go to the next step to the follow up by the one post, why is that not lying anymore in, in this part of the compound? Uh, sorry, in which case? The, the, the original, uh, in, 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 where you go, you speak that. Yeah. Yep. Then that I understand and I understand why for the unit of Latin and monopoles the financial perfection goes down yep. and that process is to be a regional way of the uh yeah. When you go to the next process when you go to the cross polar cross monopoles, yeah. Why is the argument coming from the entropic perfection is not applied in that case? Um it's Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, um, it wouldn't give you this exponential factor, and uh, the reason for that is that um, I mean, uh, intuitively, the same. It's the same thing uh, that that wins over it is that um, the uh, that even for tuft polakov monopoles, the existence of the magnetic field it um, it favors uh, the the solution which has or the it favors the outcome which which has magnetic charges in it because that's the only thing that uh, can gain energy from uh, from the magnetic field for that you need the monopoles and so that um, in I, yeah and and so yeah I think that's a, yeah we haven't it, yeah the, the to be honest, so we haven't computed the prefactor uh, for the toft polakov monopole case. And so therefore, we can't, I, I, I can't say um, for certain that there isn't an exponential factor in it. But there isn't anything. Um, yeah, I, I don't think there is, because there is, there's, there's nothing in the prefactor that would at least seem to be giving that kind of uh, that kind of factors so that's a that's a good question and that's something that we should we should be doing better but uh, but but i think it's the same thing essentially the um so so certainly when you have the monopoles um, sufficiently 
far apart so that it is it's uh, it can be well approximated by by point particles in that case um, so when we have the well separated when we have the well separated um, monopoles case the donut if the donut is sufficiently big uh, then you have you have the world line factor and the only thing that would uh, would change is that uh, is that in the prefactor your functional determinant now consists of of some of the uh, um, internal modes of the of the monopole but because the monopole is a localized localized uh, object you, you don't expect any exponential suppression from from that uh, those are just some um, di different um, di different excitations of the monopole that you are, you are including in your functional determinant I think in in this case when uh, you, you've got just a blob then it's harder to harder to imagine uh, or visualize what the what, what what kind of modes are included in the harmon in, in the in the functional determinant but that is also then we are getting so this corresponds to the case when the action becomes small and I think then we are back to your original question that when the action is small then things do become uh, more complicated in many ways and I can't claim that we've got that calculation in any way under control, but, uh, but also I think in that case, whatever uh, it is, um, it's hard to see how some new exponential suppression appears here if, if it wasn't, wasn't present here. So these are things that need to be done properly, but, um, but um, it at least would seem that they're not, there's no, big suppression like 100 orders of magnitude arising from those so let's go to the ellipsis um, yeah why is aluminium the best uh, oh. <laughs> material to capture the aluminium yes aluminium was chosen for uh, partly just because it's uh, compared to many others it's, uh, it's it's relatively cheap readily available uh, it has a low um so, so it, it 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 doesn't i'm not sure what the term is but it doesn't it, it's not a ferromagnet it doesn't get magnetized itself because that um that would um then be a problem if you want to look for some very, very um, uh, weak magnetic signal. But then at the same time also the, uh, the nucleus, the aluminium nucleus has a, has a, has a fairly um, a large um, a magnetic moment, which means that uh, the, uh, the monopoles are expected, and there's some old calculation of this type, but um, expected to, to get trapped in it. So it has the right, right properties. It's not the only thing. Actually, it's not the only thing that um, that we are using because um, there's one analysis which um, which uh, which we which we are doing is with um, with this, uh, round one of the LHC. Um, we've got the CMS beam pipe, which is beryllium. And, but in the same way, we can, we can see if something got trapped in that. The benefit of doing that is that um, the beam part is just next to where the collision happens. There's nothing uh, in front. Whereas our aluminium, um, in order for the monopoles to reach our aluminium bricks, they have to travel through various other things because it's basically, we are sharing the collision point with LHCB. And so, 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 so therefore, um, uh, the beam pipe is in particular very good for highly charged uh, monopoles, which would have got trapped in LHCb before reaching our our aluminium. So therefore, it's a, aluminium was a good choice compared to beryll beryllium. I think it's cheap. It's uh, I think beryllium is somehow difficult to handle, um, and so it's. 
so I think that's the prim primary reason is that it is just a, a very practical, but it also works for our purposes. And you said, so whenever you produce uh, the monopoly, you produce a pill. Yeah, that's right. Um, and when they get, get half of the aluminum, there's no way that they could annihilate. They can only annihilate if they, if they, um, if, if, if a north monopole meets a south monopole, and indeed they move in the opposite direction, so by the time they hit aluminium they are several meters away from, from each other, and even though they have a strong um, Coulomb-like magnetic um, attraction, at that distance it's so weak that um, uh, it it's not a, 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 the uh, the magnetic field of the aluminium nucleus is so much stronger that it doesn't affect the trapping. The and 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 also there are obviously magnetic fields present in the uh, near near the experiment. But the same same thing about those. At least the calculations uh, are suggesting that um, they don't uh, remove the uh, the monopole from the so the fields are not strong enough to uh, to overcome the uh, the potential that's trapping them to the to the nuclei. So if you trap it, you know you trap it for good. Yeah, that's so right. Why hasn't the result from the uh, last November come out? It just takes manpower and yeah. and time, and in fact, I think yeah. So currently, um, because I'm not doing that bit myself, uh, but I think the al aluminium is, is still there, so it hasn't been, hasn't even been extracted uh, yet, and then, so what we need to do, someone physically has to go, take it out, go to Zurich, where we have the place where, where we are um, scanning the, uh, the aluminium bricks with the magnetometer to see if there's if there is um, if there is a monopole uh, trapped inside, and so it just needs someone to actually actually do that manually. It's very manual work. I, I don't know how, how you can do your excitement. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I would be dying. Uh, the other question is: uh, you said um, you have to have the self-attraction, which is not a good um, approximation to you, but you are producing them so rarely, so. The fact that you, you know, I mean, you need more there, uh, results is very good. So it yeah. Be nice to, to, to do that sort of interaction. But the fact that you produce them so rarely, there aren't that many to interact with each other. So uh, it yeah. sound like self interaction, ignoring self interaction would be that bad. But it does make a make a quite a significant difference. So that's the that's the thing. Um, so it's. I mean, it depends on what you mean by by that. So here, the um, I wish I had a actual num number uh, for what GB over m, m squared is, uh, but um, but it's a this is a number um, um, which is uh, which is greater than one for for the kind of uh, um, monopoles that we are. We are looking at let's let, let's say it's ten, and so then um, the difference, especially well, I mean, yeah, you, you can then see that the difference between uh, the the free and the leading order here on this scale is 0.2. So if it gets um, multiplied by let's say ten, then we are we've got an extra additive term of two in your your action, and that that gives you order of magnitude um, uh, a, a, a suppression and so therefore in that sense uh, this is showing that ignoring the self interactions is actually I mean it makes a big difference but um, qualitatively uh, it's it's not I mean the qualitative behavior is the same and what we want to be absolutely sure because of all these uncertainties is that we are not in any part of the calculation that we are not overestimating the uh, the probability of producing monopoles because if you do that then we get uh, constraints which are not true yeah. because uh, because we've uh, made 
uh, too optimistic assumptions. So we'd rather err on the on the causes side, and so so therefore, even though we know that quantitatively uh, the red curve is not in numerical terms, it's not a good approximation. It's a very safe approximation. <laughs> yep. Thank you.